Uh, I want to begin today by thanking my wife, Jill, for stepping in on short notice last week so that I could preach at Cape Cod Church while Ben and Tammy Feldot were coping with her surgery for her brain tumor. And I'm very happy to report that Tammy is recovering very well, so well, that amazingly she was able to attend their son Cody's high school graduation yesterday. So praise God. It's just amazing. I also just want to thank our staff and our volunteers for all that they do. So many people uh, were here on Friday and Saturday uh, as we, I mean, that's our deacons, our caring heart-to-heart -heart team, our media crew, um, Chris and Joe leading music and multiple services, and, and even Corbini Greenmore, who probably deserved like hazard pay for being in the nursery yesterday with a whole bunch of little kids as uh, she was helping watch the Myricks, uh, Ch Harry's great-grandchildren. Uh, but all of you who were here on Friday and Saturday serving uh, were part of our church being able to bless the families of Joan Corcoran and Harry Myrick. We had their services on Friday and Saturday on consecutive days, two wonderful long-term members of our church uh, I'm just very grateful for both of their lives and how they blessed our congregation. Uh, and then last night we had a gospel concert by the group Greater Vision and uh, Jeff Larkin and Chuck Hilton, who are such wonderful members of our uh, Sexton team here at the church. They were here from in the morning, uh, the early in the day for the memorial service, all the way through the end of the concert and where they Bless me uh, by encouraging me to leave uh, a little after 9.30, and they helped the, the gospel guys pack up before they hit the road. So uh, just very, very proud, and you all should know. I mean, because many of you, hey, first time here today for many of you, and some of you, you know, you're here last Sunday. You don't know everything that goes on during the week. Uh, we've got a great crew. We really do, a great team, and I'm just very grateful, very proud of all of you. Way to go. Uh, earlier this week, uh, I also had a committal service for Shirley Lindstrom, who is Nina Gregson's mom and also another longtime member of our church. So I had two services for moms and one service for a dad. And obviously, I work on my sermons a little earlier. So I, you know, Harry uh, didn't pass till a little later in the week. So um, part of what I was thinking about with Shirley and with Joan is that in a healthy family, there's no one who loves you like your mom. Uh, a mother's love is truly unique. And that's nothing against all of us who are dads, okay? So don't email me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, but a, a mother's love is unique. And, and a mother's love often serves as a source of unity in a family, doesn't it? Because siblings can be very different. Uh, my, my two sisters and I, we are all very different people, all right? So siblings can be very different. Often siblings you can seem like they have almost nothing in common. But they're united by their bond to their mother who hopefully loved and nurtured and cared for them and sacrificed for them, educated them. One woman said that the, the art of mothering is to teach the art of living to children. And mothers do this by both their words and their deeds. Uh, mothers have truths, they have sayings that they teach their children. And while those can probably vary from one mom to another, it almost seems to me like mothers go to this invisible school where they're told these certain things, and then they all say them, and, and everybody knows them. You know? It's a, your, I mean, your mo mother say, if you don't have anything nice to say, They all went to the same place, you know. I am not your maid. And then you go to college and the people working in your dorm say, who do you think I am, your mother? <laughs> you know? Are you going out in that? <laughs> you know? Do you think I'm made of? I was never bored when I was... How many times do I have to? Enough. So everybody knows these things. It's amazing. It's invisible mother teaching school. 
One of the things my mother said to my sisters and I was, be your best self. That was a mom saying in my household, be your best self. And I say all this to you this morning because there's a sense in which Ephesians chapter 4, 1 to 6, which I'll read to you in a minute, is about a similar dynamic to the one of a mother's role in a family. And the Apostle Paul is saying that it's the Holy Spirit who helps to unify the different people who compose the church just in the same way that a mother can be a source of unity in a family with many children. And in these verses, Paul is basically urging the individuals who make up the family of the church to be your best self. And he mentions some of the qualities that make up our best self in Christ. And before I read this scripture, I want to note that I want you to listen closely because you're going to hear four of the nine fruit of the Spirit that Jill shared about last week from Galatians. Because Paul returns to these virtues time and time again in his letters. And two of the main themes in the book of Ephesians are about the power of the Holy Spirit and the role of the Holy Spirit and unity in the church. Now, Pastor David Pranga preached about unity last month, and then he left. And he, we're not going to see him for three and a half months, so I don't know, I don't know what that says exactly. But um, I, I am going to talk about unity a little bit today because I'm still here. So it's just the way we're going to handle it. But, you know, unity was a concern in the church in Corinth, and that's what David was preaching from, and unity was a concern for Paul in the church of Ephesus. Unity has long been a concern, and you know why? Because the church is made of people. So there you go. But unity is a vital quality for a healthy, strong family, for a healthy, strong church, even for a healthy nation. And as a church member, as a family member, as a citizen, you either contribute towards unity by what you say and what you do, or you're contributing to disunity by what you say and what you do. So listen to Ephesians chapter 4, which is a call for unity and oneness in the church. Paul writes, I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. Unity within churches across America has been challenged over the past few years. The world has become more polarizing, causing people to take sides on a host of issues. And we need to guard the unity of our church. For God to move in our church, it needs to be united. And that no matter what's happening in the culture, no matter what's happening out there in the world. So how do we maintain unity in the church when the surrounding forces out there are trying to tear it apart? Well, there's five ways you can protect the unity of our church, and that's how I want to start today. First is develop an attitude of acceptance. Accept people where they are, not where you want them to be. Don't major on minor issues. You don't need to <laughs> insist that everyone agrees with you on every minor detail. Romans chapter 14, verse 1 says, Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Notice that Paul recognizes way back then that there are disputable matters. You won't agree on everything with everybody. And you don't need to for there to be unity in the church. Second, focus on our common purpose. Our common purpose. David preached from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 in May. And that verse says, 
I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, rather, keep going. Be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Focusing on a common purpose leads to unity. And that's why we encourage folks to go through our membership class here at the church, because in that class, we lay out the values and the purpose and the focus of our church. I wouldn't want to join a church unless I knew what it was about, and we don't expect other people to do that either. So develop an attitude of acceptance. Focus on our common purpose. The third one, control your tongue. If you'd all like to look at your shoes for the next minute, I'll say the next few sentences. <laughs> the, the Bible says that gossip is sin. What is gossip? Gossip is when you're sharing a problem or a criticism with someone who is neither part of the problem nor part of the solution. If the person you're talking to is not part of the problem, and if they're not part of the solution, why are you talking to them? You know? Now, people will say, well, I needed to vent. What are you, an exhaust system? I mean, what is, what's going on here? You know? Jesus says you talk to the person. Right? You have something, you have an issue with somebody, you talk with the person. And the thing is, when you listen to somebody do that, then you become a partner in it. And, and your job then is kind of like to be a goalie in soccer. Put that ball back in play where it belongs. Say, you know, I'm not sure if you should be telling me this. Have you spoken to kick them back in play where they put them in the right direction? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Friends, that is wonderful advice. Wonderful advice. Don't let gospel fester within your circles of relationship, not in your family, not in a small group, not in the church, not where you work, not in school. It's like a weed. If you give it a chance to grow, it will spread. Fourth thing you can do to encourage, you, encourage the support of leaders. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 says, Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. I'm not trying to be self-serving here. It's in the Bible, so just listen. It says, their work is to watch over your souls, and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. So I say this not so you like, you know, do what I say and nobody gets hurt kind of thing. I say this, it's, that's not my focus. My focus, don't tempt me, you know. Uh, my focus is more as a pastor on how incredibly scary that verse is for me. How it, scary it is for me. Because I'm going to be, a, I'm going to have to give an account to God for the people I've led as a pastor. And God's going to hold me accountable for the direction of the churches I've led, for the spiritual development and maturity of the people I've led. And that is a tough task, especially in this climate that we're in right now. And so all of us who are pastors, David, Joe, myself, we need your prayers. All of our lay leaders who are giving so much of themselves, our staff, we need your prayers, we need your encouragement, we need your support. That's part of how you build unity. Fifth way to protect unity is practice God's method of conflict resolution. In Matthew chapter 18 and verses 15 to 17, Jesus gives us a plan to follow when the unity of the church is under. You can take Fred down. I'm not there yet. Thank you. When the unity of the church is under attack. When you have a problem with someone, Jesus says, go directly to that person. If that person doesn't listen, bring along another witness. If that person still doesn't listen, Jesus says, bring them before the entire church. What happens if the person still doesn't listen? Well, Jesus says you basically treat them as an unbeliever. You still love them, but you don't treat them like a person who is a member and a part of the body. Sounds harsh, but that's what Jesus says. This is how we're supposed to handle it. Unity is a responsibility, not only of pastors and leaders, it's the part of everyone in the church. Everyone in the church plays a part in either strengthening unity or weakening it, for building the strength of our faith community or weakening it, 
by what we say and what we do. And Jesus tells us in John chapter 13 that our unity is a witness to him. And in John 17, Jesus' longest prayer is a prayer for unity among all of his followers. Now, Paul says we build unity up in the church by focusing on what unites us. All those ones he mentions, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. And we're called to emphasize what unites us and to relate to one another, Paul says, with humility, with gentleness, with patience, with love, and with peace. And surprisingly, if you treat other human beings and other people in the church with humility and gentleness and patience and love and peace, guess what happens? Unity grows. Shocking. Who is someone you know who embodies those qualities that Paul describes? Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. When I think of someone who embodies those virtues, I think of my wife, Jill. Another person I think of, now you can put it up, is Fred Rogers. Um, some of you may have seen the 2019 movie, uh, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. Any of you see that movie about Fred Rogers? Uh, for those of you who didn't know, uh, don't know who this person is, Fred Rogers was the host of Public Broadcasting's longest-running television series, Mr. R Rogers' Neighborhood, which began when I was in preschool. And I can remember coming home from preschool and kindergarten and watching that show on television when I was four and five years old. And I had no way of knowing that almost 30 years later, the interim pastor I would follow here at Brewster Baptist Church Dr. Bill Barker was the voice of Dr. Bill and Elsie Platypus, two of the characters on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Can you believe that? Small world. That's true. That's true. But I remember when Fred Rogers died a number of years ago now that I was so sad. And part of why I was sad was because I fear that so much of what he embodied is no longer valued or practiced by millions of people in our country, and especially by many people in positions of power and influence in politics and in the media. As one editorial observed at the time of his death, Mr. Rogers was a model of kindness, a trait not coveted enough these days. Being rich appeals to people, so does being hip, connected, successful, but kind, patient, and friends with the delivery man doesn't seem to carry the same clout. When asked if he ever got tired of playing Mr. Rogers, he replied, my wife says, what you see is what you get. It's not hard for me to be me. This is not a show. Ted Koppel spoke of what a kind, gentle man Fred Rogers was and how he had won two Peabody Awards, four Emmys, the nation's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Fred Rogers spoke slowly, calmly, and gently. He listened. His way of being on television is the polar opposite of what we see on many, many programs today. Too many shows feature yelling, bad manners, rudeness, interruptions, insults, a lack of virtue, demeaning speech, rather than listening, genuine dialogue, and an attempt to understand and think deeply. Mr. Rogers, who many people don't know, was an ordained Presbyterian minister, also said something that takes us back to Ephesians. He said, there is a universal truth I have found in my work. Everybody longs to be loved. And the greatest thing we can do is to let somebody know that they are loved and capable of being loving. PBS president Pat Mitchell said about Fred Rogers, he is somebody who is completely integrated. He is somebody who is what he believes. He is who is what he believes. His life and his work and who he is inside are one person. For those of us who follow Christ, we can have no greater tribute than that, that we are what we believe. 
We are to lead a life, Paul says, worthy of the calling to which we have been called. Worthy of the calling to which we have been called with humility, patience, gentleness, bearing with one another in love. There, it's possible with so many hundred people here that there could be one person here today who is upset with someone. Okay, maybe there's two. <laughs> but if you're upset, you find yourself upset with someone this morning. Okay? You're upset because of something they said or something they didn't say. You're upset with something they did or with something they didn't do. Regardless, the first thing you do always in these situations is check yourself. Check yourself and ask yourself this question. Am I responding to what happened? Am I responding to this situation with humility, with gentleness, with patience, with love, and with peace? And your answer to that question can shape what you do next. Paul would urge you to keep those five things in mind. Paul believes so strongly in Christ and in living a Christ-like life, what a difference Jesus can make in a person's life, that he was willing to go to prison for the Lord. And Paul likely wrote his letter to the Ephesians from prison. He may have been in chains. And he's urging the church to make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So my question to you today is, are you doing that? Are you making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace? This coming Saturday, I'll be performing a wedding for Judy Turpin's granddaughter and her fiance. And as at so many weddings, they will be exchanging rings, which we always say are an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. They're the symbol of love that has no beginning and no end. And they're a symbol that Katie and Andrew are bound to one another for life. And when two people get married, they quickly learn <laughs> that making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace is a very wise way to relate to one's spouse. Right? Because both in marriage and in the church, the saying is true. In essentials, unity. In doubtful questions, liberty. And in all things, charity. Jesus came to show us how, through reliance on him, we can live the best way in the world as it is. And the Holy Spirit is the one who reminds us of all that Jesus taught and unites us as different as we may be individually as sisters and brothers in Christ, unites us into one family that is called the church. And together we share one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, who is above all and through all and in all. And it's up to you as an individual to welcome that one spirit into your life and to strive to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace in the church. And we're delighted that in just a few minutes, uh, I'm going to be baptizing Evan Taubert, who is accepting Christ and accepting the Spirit and becoming a part of God's church here, and we're so excited that you're doing that today, Evan. There was a woman about 500 years ago in Italy named Catherine of Genoa, and she described opening her life to the presence of the Holy Spirit this way. She said, it is as if I have given the keys of my house to love with permission to do all that is necessary. Are you willing to do the same? Please pray with me. Lord, we want to grow in Christ's likeness. And we want to be instruments for unity and not division in the church and in our world. Help us surrender to you and to give the keys of our house to your spirit, letting you have complete control. Give us the trust to invite you into every room, 
Don't come as an occasional guest who we are relieved to see depart or to whom we don't open everything. Enter and become the owner of the whole house. We don't want to turn our eyes from you, O oh God. There we want them to stay and not move no matter what happens to us within or without. Gracious God, we thank you for inviting us to be a part of your family. And we praise you for giving us your spirit and the power to live as Christ calls us to live, as sons and daughters of God. In his name we pray. Amen.